joined from central London by the new Justice Secretary, David Liddington. Hello, thank you for coming on the show this morning. Hi. Now, I know you were hoping to come in and Good talk about you. your uh, shiny new justice brief, but once again, the front pages of the newspapers are all about Theresa May's leadership. According to the Sunday Times and the Mail on Sunday, Andrew Mitchell has said that the PM's got to go. She's got no authority. There's a kamikaze group of Conservative MPs willing to risk another election. Are these plots happening? I think there's always in July a lot of gossip, you know, hot weather, people going to rather too many summer parties for their own good, and you get this sort of silly story. What I see uh, with the Prime Minister and my Cabinet colleagues is a government that's knuckling down to work, that's uh, saying, look, the public have given us the election result, we have to live with that, make adjustments to, to that. But there's some big problems out there. The impact of digital technology on our economy, how we fund and reform our public services in the future, how we deal with a huge intergenerational issue like social care. And I think the public want the government to be getting on with that. And uh, sort of self-indulgent gossip really doesn't help anybody. We need to get the job done. It's an admirably loyal answer from you. But you and I both know that these conversations are going on. Has Theresa May lost her authority? No, I see. I look at the Prime Minister's performance, at Prime Minister's questions, and the support she's been getting from the Conservative side of the House. I look at uh, how she's been chairing cabinet meetings every week. Uh, I look at how she's taken charge of the Ministerial Task Force on Grenfell. And I see somebody who is very determined to lead and to get on with the job. Now, I'm keen to talk to you about austerity. Uh, we've just shown a film where I went to a school in Hackney to talk about funding changes, to talk about the public sector pay cap. And teachers there were really struggling. They felt underappreciated. They felt like they were, couldn't do the things that they wanted to do with their lives, like buy a house. Is it time now for that pay cap to end, in your personal opinion? I think that you've got to look at the issues of pay in the context of public spending overall. It's worth reminding ourselves that so far this government has implemented every one of the recommendations from the pay review bodies that have come in the this pay year. Review so, bodies, um, the pay yeah, review got, bodies, three outstanding. Are, the pay review bodies are effective instructors on what to do by the government. So that's an easy you know, excuse for you, isn't it? No, 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 no. The pay, that's not, no, that's not the case at all. The pay review bodies are independent. They obviously take advice and take evidence from the government and the government, the Treasury on behalf of the government, puts forward the overall arguments about the need for the country to live within its means. So, um, you know, that's the record so far. Now, you know, clearly, um, every minister in the government wants to see us putting as much money as we can afford to do into the front line of public services. And you look at our track record, you see the education budget has gone up and is due to rise further. Same is true of health and so on. But we have at the same time to take account of the fact that the country still has a deficit. And as long as we have an annual deficit, that means that the amount we pay, not on public services, but the amount we're paying on interest payments is, is uh, going up each year and it also means that there's an accumulated underlying debt that we're passing on to the next generation to to carry on their backs and try to repay so yeah it's important to look at this in the round the country's got to live within its means we need economic policies to get the growth which will allow us to spend more on key public services like schools um, and we need to try and make sure that we are fair to the people work like teachers like nurses doctors working very hard in the front line of those services it's quite a novel experience to hear a government minister sticking to the government line on this. So certainly some of your colleagues didn't appear to get that memo, people like Boris Johnson and Michael Gove. So if government policy is being made by those people who shout the loudest, this is your chance. What's top of your wish list? What do you want to happen? I think what, what's going to happen is that the, the government will take a collective view on the overall balance uh, in, in public spending, borrowing, taxation. You know, there's a budget later this year at uh, which the Chancellor will set out uh, the, 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 the scope for making changes in the, in the year ahead and we've got three outstanding pay review bodies due to report from uh, the, this year's round and obviously we will be responding in due course to those. Let's turn to your justice uh, brief now, uh, shall we, uh, finally, after going through uh, mm. 
uh, some other issues before. Now, a report this summer said that violence in our prisons is now out of control. The head of the Prison Officers Association says it's a bloodbath. Do you accept that the prison system that you've inherited is in crisis? I think the prison system has got very severe problems, yes. And I would share the view that my predecessor, Liz Truss, uh, expressed publicly in the white paper of November last year that at the moment prisons are not working in the way that we want them to do. There's too much violence, too much self-harm, uh, too many drugs uh, getting into prisons and we're not making enough use of the time we have people in prison to get them educated, get them to take on skills that make them employable when they're released and less likely to commit crimes again. Um, and there's a programme of work that we've got, including targeted spending, to deliver improvements. That starts with two and a half thousand extra prison officers to ease the pressures on uh, the current hard-working prison officer teams and uh, make sure that they, they can manage the regimes and the security more effectively in prisons. But it also is the money that we've spent on 300 new sniffer dogs to trace uh, dr drugs uh, in prisons. It's the new kit that we've got into every prison now uh, to, uh, to try to detect mobile phones that are being used illegally there. It's the new intelligence unit that we've set up inside the uh, prison service to try to make sure we're dealing with things like organised gangs. And we're getting many, many more organised gang members in prisons now than there were in the past. It's the work we are doing uh, with the police to share intelligence and information on the use of drones because we're finding that criminal enterprises are using drones to try to take illegal drugs and illegal mobile phones over the prison walls. So on all these fronts, we're moving forward. I'd like to see us move further and faster. I'm determined to get improvements. We start, yes, as you say, by acknowledging that there are some very big challenges that fa face us, but we have a determination and a plan to get those improvements, and that will make the country safer in the long term, particularly if we can get the education, the training, the work programmes effective in prisons so that we have people coming out who can get a job and who are less likely to commit crime again. You talk about those big challenges. It's not been helped, has it, let's be honest, by the fact that the government's cut 7,000 prison officers since coming into power and has only recommitted to rehiring half of them. When the government coalition government came in in 2010, we were facing a huge economic crisis and a massive problem with a, a government deficit of Greek proportions. And tough, immediate decisions had to be taken then that affected the prison service, the Ministry of Justice, along with practically every other department to try to restrain spending so we could get that deficit down. That has brought us some opportunity now, that, that discipline over our finances, the tough decisions over public sector pay restraint, the tough decisions about benefit reform mean that we have the headroom now, having cut the deficit by three quarters, to provide the extra two and a half thousand prison officers that I've talked about, to commit ourselves to eight billion pounds of additional spending on the National Health Service during the lifetime of this parliament. So actually, Sound money and living within your means is what frees us then to make improvements in public spending in the front line when the finances are in order. Now, before you go, I'm keen to talk to you about the really tragic case of Charlie Gard, the little boy who's terminally mm. ill. His parents are locked in a court battle to try and extend his treatment yeah. so that they can go to the US and try out experimental uh, therapy. Do you think it's right that judges can overrule the wishes of his parents? But the, it, is, it is right that judges interpret the law independently and dispassionately. Um, as, as ministers and as a government, we have no role to play in the Charlie Gard case, uh, you know, as would be the case with any other proceeding in court. What is happening in that case is that Charlie's parents, and, and goodness knows, any of us, particularly if we have children, must feel desperately for them. These parents are putting their case through their lawyers. The hospital doctors are putting their case. Uh, and an independent advocate um, from the court service, acting as, as the independent guardian for Charlie, uh, is putting a, a case to the court. And what all of them are arguing is what is the course of action 
that is in Charlie's best interests. That is, that is what the argument hinges upon. Frankly, I do not envy the judges who are having to take decisions on this. It must be an incredibly pressured, probably emotional, you know, underneath the judicial professionalism, really emotional, sort of heart-wrenching case for them to have to decide. But they are independent. They know their duty is to decide the case on the basis of what they genuinely consider to be uh, in the best interests of Charlie himself.